so privileged that Cindy allows me this honor to speak to you beautiful faces. And I want to say how grateful I am, Cindy, for that powerful message on the cross. I love the cross. And it was presented with precision and beauty and anointing. Enough anointing to destroy the enemy's yoke on your life and lift every burden. I don't know about you, but 2023 has been a hard year for me. I don't usually even refer to my notes when I'm speaking, but today I'm going to because I don't want to leave a thing out that the Lord has given me. And you know, the Bible says to be quick to hear. And so you're going to be quick to hear today, and I'm not going to be slow to speak. My message today is called Don't Lose Your Power. Now, it's not that you can lose it as in you don't remember where you put it. It's that you lose it because you quench the power within you. And we're going to talk about some power thieves, but mostly because of the power thieves in my own life. And hopefully you will relate to that. I have a lamp here that I borrowed, and I, I think we need more light, so I'm going to turn it on. What's the matter with this lamp? It's not plugged in. There's nothing wrong with the power source, but if you don't stay plugged in to the power source who is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus dwelling in you, then your power is diminished and you, in a sense, lose your power. So let me just tell you something about my 2023, the first two months the year started off with great promise. All of these prophetic voices were proclaiming, this is going to be the year when everything that's been lost has been restored to you. This has been the year where the, everything the locust has eaten will be repaid. This is going to be a year of celebration. And you know what? I'm super excited because there's three months left. The year is not over. But the Lord always calls the end from the beginning. So here comes January 2023. I am so full of excitement and expectancy. On January 13th of this year, it was the 10th year of my father's departure to heaven. My mother, my 91-year-old mother, who drives a pickup truck and works six days a week full-time, 90 years old, 91 years old, and she's tiny, 90 pounds. Some of you have met her. She still wears a bouffant. Her hair is bigger than her body. And she is a firecracker extraordinaire. But she posted on social media, this is the day the light went out of my life. Because there is a process of mourning and grieving, and then there is a spirit of grief that attaches to that. If at some point you don't move forward. And she never chose to move forward. That afternoon, my husband and I were in the car and my phone rang and it was one of my sisters. I didn't want to answer the phone because usually she's the type where you say, hey, I got to go. And she goes, just one more thing. 30 minutes later, her one more thing is stretched out. And she was screaming hysterically and she said, mom fell and she's broken. She thought it was her hip, it was her femur. So they took her to University Hospital, and cheers to University Hospital. It is a great trauma center, except the ER. Please don't go there. But, if you, but otherwise, it's a great hospital. And she was in extraordinary pain. She kept saying, please let me die. Please let me die. We stood over her. We spoke life. We asked for angelic intervention. We pled the blood of Jesus. All the while, my little sister was suffering had been diagnosed with cancer, stage four, about two and something years prior to that. I spent the whole month of November 2022 in my closet on my face, secretly weeping and grieving because last chosen, as I stood up here and I looked in the audience and I saw her, I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, this will be her last chosen. You know what you do when the Holy Spirit warns you of something? You just do this because that can't be God but I knew it was. 
The rest of the family thought it was the treatment making her so sick. It was the treatment making her sleep so much. It was the treatment making her lose weight. It was the treatment making her curled up in the sofa that every time you saw her, she couldn't get up. She had to use a walker. My beautiful little sister, would you put the picture on the screen, please? At some point, the picture will be, there you go. Here she is. Wasn't she beautiful? And then the last picture that she and I took together is also available. That was Thanksgiving. She forced herself to be there, took every ounce of strength in her to be with us. But she was a lovely, lovely human being. Very caring, very giving, very generous, very concerned about other people's needs, even in her own suffering. I hate cancer. I despise it. It is an evil disease of Egypt. And I commit it to the Lord that I will fight it tooth and nail for anyone who wants me to stand with them. So we went through two weeks of being in university. We went through the rehab, and it was very painful. It was very difficult. And then we brought her home, and she lived with my sister. And then on February 11th, my sister left her body. And she went to be with Jesus. On February the 19th, my son-in-law, uh, the husband of my youngest daughter, who was an Iron Man multiple times, fell playing soccer with children and tore his patellar tendon. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's the tendon that holds your kneecap in place. And when I tell you it ended up in the middle of his thigh, I'm not kidding, I saw it. He was told it was a six-month recovery. He would not be able to drive which left my youngest daughter, who works, responsible. I, you know what? In Cindy's in my day, we kind of did everything with the kids, right? And we did all the driving, all the everything, and the husbands didn't. But apparently, in the younger generation, it's a shared responsibility. <laughs> Something of which I am not accustomed so I want to say hats off to you single moms. I applaud you with all my heart. Because she went from being a mom of three to a mom of four. Now, this is no disgrace to men. But there is a reason God did not design them to have children. Because it would have depopulated the society. They would have died with the first labor pain. And we all know that, right? And so she became the mother of four, the driver, the everything. And it was very difficult. He had surgery on February 24th. My sister's funeral was on February 25th. On March the 6th, one of my grandsons fell jumping hurdles in a competition and had multiple bone contusions. And I will not go on about what happened in the weeks following, but there was a lot of hurt. There was a lot of dismay. There was a lot of confusion. There were a lot of things that were exposed and revealed that were very painful. The rest of the year to this date, there's been a lot of disappointment and confusion. And God is not the author of confusion, and I know that. But I'm saying all that to say, and I can tell you with all my heart, that in all of that, I did not lose my power. I stay connected. Now, before you applaud, let me get to the end of my message. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and we've already heard this wonderful scripture quoted along with Acts 1-8, when Jesus was being taken up to heaven, he said, all authority and power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go then and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you even unto the end of the age. And then he told them to wait until the power of the Holy Spirit came. And in Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses all the way to the ends of the earth. That word power Lisa mentioned it last night. It's the word dunamis. 
And it means miraculous power. It's not our own power. It's his power that dwells within us. It means might and strength and ability. And it comes through union and communion with Jesus Christ, with the cross of Jesus Christ, and with the resurrection power because he did not stay on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he raised us up together with him and seated us with him at the right hand in the heavenly places. And so I want to talk to you for a few minutes about power thieves. If I named all of them, we would be here until Chosen 2024. So let me just give you a list of some of them. There are the D-bombs. Doubt, despair, disappointment, depression, division, defeat, delays, disillusionment, distractions. And then there is worry, anxiety, oppression, unforgiveness, resentment, offense, grudges, insecurity, inferiority, anger, rage, a bad temper, impatience, shame, and inadequacy, and judging others and comparison and the list goes on and on and on but I just want to address a few that I've struggled with and I have a feeling that you have too the whole message of, ch of chosen power, Cindy mentioned it so powerfully, was 2 Timothy 1.7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. But I want to ask you today, how many of you have ever had a spirit of fear? Raise your hands. There is not any of us who have not experienced that force of fear to the point we're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said it is a spirit of fear. It is a driving evil force that comes to consume you and separate you from being plugged in to the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. And so rather than telling you a story about me, because I have a lot, I'm going to tell you a story about a friend of mine. Because staying plugged into the power is a choice. And I've told you about her before, but I'm going to tell you what has happened to her since then. My very dear friend of over 40 years, her name is Margie Palm. And she was abducted in 1981, 42 years ago, by a serial rapist murderer who was on the FBI Most Wanted list and had raped and murdered around 20 women who had murdered a woman in the parking lot of a local restaurant the night before. He abducted her with a 35, is it Magnum Rick? 35 something. It was a 35 something. In her ribs, put her in the car, told her to get on her hands, and if she got off of her hands, he would kill her. But she heard the Holy Spirit because she was empowered by him. She had spent three hours that morning in prayer. And she heard the Holy Spirit say, get off of your hands, lay hands on him, and decree that that day he would serve Jesus Christ. And she said, I'm going to pray for you. He said, I'll kill you if you do. She said, I'm going to pray for you. She took off her hands and she said, in the name of Jesus, this day, this man will serve Jesus Christ. And I bind every spirit that is operating in his life. And he said, oh my God, I've abducted a religious freak. Ten hours later, this man threw his hands up in the air. It was supernatural. I can't tell the whole story. And he said, Jesus, forgive me for all the bad things I've done. And he gave his heart to Jesus. She had witnessed to him that entire time. That same night, she told the authorities because he let her go. She drove home. And police had circled the cul-de-sac because by then they figured out that they knew he had abducted someone, that it was her. And she wasn't afraid until the police handed her a martini. True. It's a true story. I've heard it many times. She went to see him before he was executed. And he said to her, Margie, do you know why I didn't kill you? And she said, God? And he said, no. I didn't kill you because you were not afraid. All the other women were so afraid they would let me do whatever I wanted. But you had no fear because she was operating in power, love, and a sound mind. However, I told you the story because of what has happened 42 years later. She tried and tried and tried to get out of the Christian community and get the story into the hands of the world who would know a loving Savior who went to the cross on behalf, as Cindy said, for all mankind. But nobody would open the door. 42 years, and she finally said, Lord, you told me to tell my story. I give up. If anybody, if you want this story told, you're going to have to do it. 
Her story got into the hands of a big wig with Vanity Fair magazine. It came out in September. It has been one of the most widely read stories published by them. And you can get online. True crime, true faith, the serial killer and the Texas mom who stopped him. And, and People Magazine picked up the story after that. And I'm just telling you, the story is like viral. People all over are saying, I want to know about the God and the faith of this woman. And next year, if Cindy gives me the privilege of speaking, I'm going to tell you what happened after that. It was very powerful. In Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, the apostle Paul prayed, may he grant you out of the rich treasury of his glory to be strengthened with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit himself indwelling your innermost being and personality. May Christ through your faith actually dwell and settle down and abide and make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love, founded securely on love, that you may have the power. You see, you can't separate the love of God from the power of God. If you're walking in the love of God, you will automatically be empowered and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, and that you would be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God, and may have the richest measure of the divine presence, and become a body holy, filled, and flooded with God himself. If you are plugged into the love of God, you are rooted deep in love, just like my friend was, and even a serial murderer rapist could not steal the power of God's love. The second way we lose our power is with our words. And Cindy already quoted Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power right here of your tongue, and they who love it will eat its fruit. You are a sum total of the words you speak. And I was going to tell my own story, but uh, Lisa, I'm going to tell Lisa's story instead. In Matthew 12, 36 and 37, that every word, careless word people speak, they will give an account of on the day of judgment. By your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned and held guilty, one translation says. And I thought her illustration last night was so powerful. She, first of all, was dying. She heard them say she's going to die. And she knew that if she was vented, she would die. And so with whatever strength she, she, said, she had, she said the one word, when you say this one name, you throw the whole Bible at the enemy. She said Jesus. And then when the doctor said, well, you're going to live, but you'll never preach again. You're going to be on oxygen the rest, rest of your life. She said, with the breath she had, one word, pneuma. And that Greek word, pneuma, actually means air in motion. In the New Testament, as she said, it refers to the Holy Spirit. You see, you don't have to say a bunch of words. Jesus, pneuma. Life was in her tongue, and she's alive. I can see her right here on the front row. She's very alive. Watch your words. And the third way, power thief, and then I'm going to get to the big way, and that is focusing on the past. And I don't just mean the bad past. I'm talking the good past. I would like to ask you, how many of you, honestly, you know, I don't want you to raise your hand because it would be embarrassing. Maybe in your marriage, you told your husband, you don't bring me flowers anymore. You used to do this. You used to gaze at me, long for me. You used to, you used, you know what? That's dangerous. Living, the reason God put your face on the front of you was so that you wouldn't look at your past. Do not live your life looking in the rearview mirror. After my sister passed, my godmother, the woman I call my godmother, 
godliest woman I've ever known to date, sent me a word, and the word was, do not look at the past. I am the God of creation. Do you trust me? And I asked her, are you referring to my sister? Because you know how you always hear people say they died a peaceful death, surrounded by family and friends? She didn't. She suffered horribly. And I'm not saying this in any disrespect. My, my own daughter was a hospice nurse for six years. But when I'm telling you a hospice from hell came to her, I am not kidding. They left her in level 10 pain, and my daughter took over. And thank God for her. She had to take over in the dispensing of the medication because this lady could not have cared less. And we forgave her. Uh, most hospices are amazing. That just wasn't our experience. She suffered more than I've ever seen anybody suffer. I am 70 years old. I have never seen anybody suffer the way she suffered. And she did not die in peace because she did not want to die. She wanted to see her little grandchildren grow up. She wanted to see her two-year-old grandson that would never remember her grow up. She wanted to see her children live in prosperity. And she was my biggest fan. After every chosen, she would go, Sandy. Now, this, this was a lie, but this is what sisters do. <laughs> Sandy, you were the best. <laughs> I never believed her. I bet you she's saying that from heaven, don't you think? Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, but whatever things that I, I had that might have been given to me, I have come to consider as one combined loss for the sake of Christ. I do not consider, brethren, that I've captured and made it my own yet, but there's one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus has called us forward. I could have lived in such sorrow over her passing, or I could take up the baton and all of the wonderful things about her incorporate into my own life. And that's what I've chosen to do. In Isaiah 26, 13 through 15, and I'm telling you this scripture, I saw it clearly, will set some of you free. O Lord, our God, other masters beside you have ruled over us, but we will acknowledge and mention your name only. The former tyrant masters are dead. They will not live and reappear. They are powerless ghosts. They will not rise and come back. Therefore, you have visited and made an end of them and caused every memory of them and every trace of their supremacy to perish. I'm telling you today, the hurtful memories, the good memories, call them a powerless ghost and use them only as illustrations to help other people. The fourth power thief, and this is the one that I really want to focus on, guilt and accusation. Guilt and accusation. The end of August and the first beginning of September, I'm just going to share my heart with you because you know it's so easy to look at a speaker and say, well, they've got it all together. They don't understand what I go through. That is the biggest lie from the pit of hell. I mean, I know some of these people really well. And they bleed, and I bleed just like you do. I started having these flaming missiles come at me such as I've never had. I started hearing in my voice, the enemy will speak to you in the first person, by the way. Yes. My own voice saying, I should have done more. I'm the reason she died. I could have prayed more. I could have fasted more. I could have rallied more troops. I could have this. I could have that. I could have demanded more of her. I could have insisted on more treatment. I could have, I could have, I should have, I could have, I should have, I could have, I didn't. I caused her to die. And so... I didn't tell anybody because I'm careful with my words. But I decided. We started back up. We had taken a short time off from the women's ministry to get ready for the fall. And I decided that I was just going to call my dear, dear friend Cindy and resign. I'm not kidding. And then, you know, you can tell God all you want. I can't take anymore. That's a bad idea. Because he's the one that knows when you can't take anymore. 
On September the 9th, my friend, Pam Williams, sent me this simple quote. Now, remember, nobody knew what I was going through. Nobody, not even my husband. And it just said, John 151, Jesus said, you will see and you will. John 151 is when Jesus said, from now on, you will see the heavens open and the Son of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, or excuse me, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In other words, when we pray in the name of Jesus, the angels perform it on our behalf. And so I started feeling this thing lift from me, but it wasn't finished. On September 11th of all dates, 9-11, my friend Janice Wooldridge texted me. And again, nobody knew what I was going through. And she said, Sandy, I was praying for you. And as I prayed, the Lord showed me an angel that the Lord sent to hold you up so that you could stand during that difficult time with your sister. And so I wrote a sarcastic text back. I said, well, I sure hope he hasn't left. And she said, oh, no, he's been assigned to you. And then Luke twenty two forty three. Now an angel appeared to Jesus from heaven, strengthening him. I want to say to you today, if you feel like you're in a weak place, like Lisa gave my invitation last night, just so you know, if you feel like you're in a weak place, don't forget the Lord will send an angel assigned to you to strengthen you. Do you think when she was almost dying in that hospital bed that there were angels there? I saw it with their hands out. No, they're mighty in strength. She said, Jesus. She said, Numa. And it came to pass. And so I told Janice, I wrote her a text and I said, I haven't told anybody this. And I told her what I've been going through. And she said, no, Isaiah 14, 4. The enemy says, the onslaught, or excuse me, the Lord says, the onslaught of the enemy is over. You will jeer at the king of Babylon and recite this proverb, your oppressor has been stilled and your onslaught is over. I want to say to those of you today who have trouble receiving the promises of God because you allow the demonic hold of guilt and condemnation, that Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you know why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And when she said, Isaiah 14, 4, pow, it lifted from me. Now, I want you to look at the screen and watch a very short clip, and then we're going to close. She wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn it for herself. What have you learned, Dorothy? What? I think that it, that it wasn't enough just to want to see Uncle Henry and Auntie M. And it's that if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. We can cut it. There. I never really lost it to begin with. That's all it is. But that's so easy. I should have thought of it before. All right. Did you get it? She said, you always had the power, but you wouldn't have believed it. So what have you learned? I've learned who I am. And I'm going to tell you how to learn who you are. One day Jesus said, Peter, to Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter just said, well, some say you're John, some say you're this, some say you're that. And then Jesus said, but who do you say I am? And he said, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. You are Peter. He renamed him. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And do you know when Peter discovered and confessed who Jesus was, then Jesus told Peter who Peter was. If you want to know who you are, find out who Jesus is. I took my journal just the other day. And the Lord said, who do you say that I am? And I wrote line after line after line after line. And the most splendid thing happened. And I, we don't have time for me to read it all to you. I only have four minutes left. Lord, you are my savior, my atonement, my deliverer, my rescuer, the lover of my soul, my healer, my provider, my refuge, my fortress, my answer, the way, the truth, the life, and on and on and on. And I just, just lifted his name up. I listed everything I know about Jesus. And then I said, now, Lord, who do you say that I am? And do you know that everything he said about himself to me, daughter, you are my daughter who is saved, a recipient of my grace, atoned, delivered, rescued, healed, loved, provided for, protected, fortified, answered, alive, and on and on and on. Because as you are, so is he in this world. If you want to know who you are, find out who Jesus is. You had a great beginning last night and this morning. Two messages that exalted the Spirit of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to do something. I just want you to stand up. We're going to say a very short prayer. Very short prayer. Just stand up on your feet. And with faith and in your heart, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, reveal to me who you are. And reveal to me who I am in your holy name. Now let me tell you something. Who you are is not your designer bags and your car and your home and all those things. And I like things. I, things are fun. But they don't have me. I have things. They don't have me. That's not who you are. You look in the mirror of the word. Before this day is over, you're going to know who you are. I have a commitment before Jesus that anyone who is suffering from cancer, I will pray for them. I don't care if I'm at HEB. I don't care where I am. I, I'm out the car wash. People just have this way of just, I mean, I meet them and they tell me their whole life. But it's because of the commission go into the world. And so I just want to ask you privately, I'm done. But if, if you have been diagnosed with that disease, I want to pray for you. And I will pray for you with my whole being. We've got to wipe this out of the body of Christ so we can go out and reach the world with a Savior who not only saves but heals.